welcome today um, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to this launch vic webinar we're looking forward to a fantastic conversation exploring alternative investment options for founders and investors as we always do at launch vic i'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land upon which we are meeting today for me it's the wurundjeri people of the kulin nation um, but i know that we have people right across australia and indeed in other nations joining us um, for this uh, webinar today I'm also thrilled to officially welcome our chair, um, Lee Jasper, who is here today, not in his capacity as chair of LaunchVic, but in his capacity as chairman and partner of Second Courtship Ventures. And I'd also like to acknowledge other LaunchVic board members that are joining us today. Uh, we have a large number of res registrations and it comes as little surprise that capital continues to be a topic of great interest to founders, investors and more broadly the startup ecosystem. So welcome everybody, we hope you find today very useful. At Launch Vic, we've most hosted many conversations over the last couple of years, focusing on venture capital and angel networks, and particularly around early stage capital, um, to really help investors and founders get a better understanding of how they can access capital and what the opportunities are in our fabulous ecosystem. But today we're branching out a bit and we're going to dive into a conversation about alternative investments that exist for startups, scale ups and investors. But before we get started, I'd like to say a couple of things on housekeeping. As we always do for Launch Vic webinars, we have our Q&A channel. Please do send your questions on this and I'll do my very best to moderate what I'm sure is going to be a very thoughtful and interesting discussion. Um, we won't be, I won't be monitoring the um, chat channel. Um, that's the best way to communicate with fellow attendees, but please, please do send your questions to the Q&A channel so that I can make sure I include them in our discussion. Um, as always, there's an obligatory disclaimer, and it goes without saying that today's conversation is simply that, a conversation. We're not here to provide investment advice. So without further ado, it gives me great pleasure to formally introduce our esteemed panelists. Uh, firstly, as I mentioned before, we're joined by Lee Jasper. Lee is someone who needs very little introduction, having co-founded one of Victoria's most successful unicorns, Aconex. We're now very privileged to have Lee as chair at Launch Vic through undoubtedly what's an incredibly important time as Victoria recovers from the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic, but also a very exciting time post-Victorian budget. Lee holds many positions, including CEO of Sanyal Ventures, non-executive director of Seek, Salter Properties, Building Acts and the Bennett Institute. But he's here today in his capacity as partner of Second Quarter Ventures, Australia's first secondary fund. So Lee, thank you for joining us here today. Thanks, Kate. Very kind of you. Next, I'd like to welcome Jill Story, CEO of the crowdfunding platform Ready Fund Go. Jill is also a director of the Crowdfunding Institute of Australia and was previously a partner at Deloitte's KPMG and Anderson. Jill has been involved in crowdfunding since 2012 when she created her first platform and has experience with product-based, equity-based and donation-based crowdfunding. And I have to say an extra big thanks to Jill who has just informed us that she's joining us from the UK where it's 3 a.m. So we really appreciate you making the time. <laughs> thanks. And finally, I'd like to introduce John Prentice, um, Investment Director at Seattle-based Lighter Capital, a leading early stage lender providing revenue-based financing, uh, term loans and working capital facilities to startups. He has primarily worked with companies in the San Francisco Bay area and is currently responsible for Lighter Capital's expansion into Australia as well as Canada. John is joining us from Seattle and John, we very much appreciate you giving up a piece of your evening to join us here today. Oh, no worries. Not as bad as uh, 3, 3 a.m. in the morning. So thank you for having us. <laughs> Thanks. So to get going, I, I always think it's very interesting to discover how people land in startup investing land. It's not a, a common investment journey. So I'd really like to just um, take a moment to explore how you um, ended up being involved in, in startup investing. So Lee, we might start with you, if we may. Thanks, Kate. Uh, well, as a former founder, I think it's sort of natural that once you've built a business, you kind of end up investing back into other businesses. And uh, without the investors that came into Aconix in the early days, we wouldn't have been able to build what we built. So I think it's uh, yeah, it's a uh, part of, uh, of of creating that virtuous cycle, giving back a bit, um, but most importantly, uh, being able to help. And I think uh, you know, I enjoy it and it's what I've done. So I want to keep doing more of it. Thank you. And Jill, how about yourself? What led you to get involved? Um, well, it was quite in the early days of crowdfunding in 2012. Um, I'd um, 
given up, um, um, I've been a partner at KPMG in the UK and I'd given up and I'd um, been thinking about crowdfunding for a while. And um, it was, um, the Olympics was on in London. And at the time it was just after the GFC and families were struggling. So I set up a platform at the time to help um, fund um, junior sporting stars. It was a donation based platform. And that's how I got started. Then I came to Australia and I was um, a, a partner at Deloitte and um, I was also um, got involved in advisory capacity with um, um, Ready Fund Go and um, helping startups and then I really enjoyed the journey of helping early stage businesses and um, get off the ground so um, and you see so many different types of businesses and um, people um, on their journeys and being able to help people along along the road has been fantastic so I really enjoy um, getting involved. Thank you. And uh, very interesting that it came out of the GFC. And I think we're in a very similar time in our in our economic history. And it is a great time for innovation, albeit very challenging for a lot of people. So um, it, 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 we find ourselves in a very interesting time. John, how about yourself? How did you start investing? Yeah, I would say um, a little bit. I kind of grew up around it. So um, I'm born and raised in the Seattle area. And my family actually did a lot of angel investing the Seattle area for some of the startups um, that have come out of this area when kind of angel investing and kind of the VC model started emerging in the US in the 70s and 80s. Um, so kind of early exposure to it, I would say kind of growing up. Um, you know, beyond that, uh, I spent a couple of years in the Bay Area, I worked at Siemens in their corporate venture group. Um, so doing corporate venture investments and partnerships, um, mostly energy and clean tech. Did that for a couple of years, um, wanted to get back from San Francisco to Seattle. So I started connecting and networking with the local VCs in Seattle. Um, and there was a VC called Voyager Capital, which is a major VC in Seattle that invested in a company called Lighter Capital, where I'm now, um, which is really a specialty finance alternative lending platform um, that they invested in. So got connected and I just thought it was really interesting in the sense of um, I was working with entrepreneurs, right? Still doing an investment role, but also kind of simultaneously building a business too, since we're technically a specialty finance company. Um, so it was kind of that, the joy, I guess, what attracted me was the idea of that I could do something operational while, while still working with entrepreneurs. Fantastic, thank you. So we're here today to talk about alternative investments, and I suspect um, we should begin with a discussion about what we actually mean and what we're talking about. I don't think there's anyone on the line that wouldn't understand what crowdfunding is, but there's also a lot of nuance in that. So Jill, can I ask you to talk a little bit about the various types of crowdfunding and what should founders be looking, uh, when should founders be looking to, to crowdfund as a source of capital? Uh, yes. So as people will know, um, there's different types of crowdfunding. So there's donation based, equity based, debt based, reward based. Um, typically for founders, um, donation based can be um, used sometimes if you've got um, a sustainable idea or you're looking at doing something around the environment. Some people will donate, but it's unusual to get that much in donation based funding for a business. Um, on the debt side, um, it's you need to have the debt to go for debt based crowdfunding you really need to have a, a constant revenue stream because you need to be able to service the debt so um, that can be something to look at later but in uh, an early stage you really want to be looking at either reward based or equity based crowdfunding now the reward base is effectively a pre-sale of a product so it, it works best if it's a, a b2c type product and it works best if it is a product. Sometimes you can do reward-based crowdfunding with a service, um, but most times um, a product works better. And people will know the best example um, in Australia um, with the biggest reward-based crowdfunding campaign um, was Flowhive, um, and they raised um, $16.9 million, um, dollars, um, which is more than the equity crowdfunding campaigns because for equity crowdfunding people will know there's a, a limit in Australia of um, five thousand five sorry five million dollars um, five million dollars um, a year that you can raise on equity based crowdfunding um, when you look at equity based crowdfunding um, you want to be thinking about um, is it B two C or B two B um, equity based crowdfunding can be used um, for B two B but still B to C often works better where you've got an audience and you can um, um, get the audience um, engaged in advance um, because you do need to build a crowd in advance before um, launching on either equity 
or reward-based crowdfunding. And, and that's actually one of the um, biggest mistakes that many people make. Um, they jump in too quickly to launch their campaign um, without spending enough time to build their crowd in advance. And if you're looking at equity crowdfunding, um, you need to go through the, the legislation, the different rules. Um, but it's really important to think about, um, have you got um, some funds um, raised in advance? Because for most campaigns, you'd want to make sure that you've got about 30% of your funding lined up before you launch. And although um, in Australia, the, um, the limit for each year is 5 million that you can raise, um, probably, um, the most common amount raised or sort of the range is really around about 400,000 um, to a, a million. There's a, there's a few campaigns, a handful in the range of two to three million. Um, but um, really, if you're looking at raising on equity-based crowdfunding, if um, you're looking at more in the sweet spot of under, 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 under about a, a million. So that gives a bit of a, an idea of scope and where it fits in. Also in terms of the journey, the fundraising journey, I think most people will start off as founders with um, raising from, well, friends, family and fools. And then possibly um, then you go to look at angel investors and there's actually quite a gap um, in that um, section from going from friends, family to angels. So often as most people know, it's called the valley of death. And that's where crowdfunding, um, both the reward-based and equity-based, can fit quite well into that um, space to get people through that valley of death um, to, to angel investors. Sometimes it can be used at a later stage as well, but that's typically the area where most people are, are coming in um, to use it to get through that early, early stage. Fantastic. And some real nuggets of gold in there. So thank you. John, can I throw to you now um, to explain what venture debt is? I, I suspect uh, you live and breathe this every day, but I, I suspect there are some people on the line who aren't as familiar because it's not been a traditional lending avenue no. in Australia. Yeah, I mean, obviously, it's a much kind of newer model to Australia. It's a more developed in the, in the US right now. Um, so venture debt historically is, is lending to startups. Um, there's a couple of institutions in the US that are very active doing this. One is Silicon Valley Bank, which is a big tech bank. Um, but essentially, instead of a startup going out and raising equity, or maybe a startup wants to delay the point they're going to raise equity, they can raise money as a loan. Um, and typically, venture debt in the US um, is really structured to only companies that have raised equity capital, or raised VC. So usually they want to say, see, you've raised a series A of you know, from a rental investor of a certain amount. And they're really kind of lending against that round. Um, so that's most of the venture debt, venture lending that happens in the US and other parts of the world. Um, what we do at Letter Capital is actually mostly non-equity sponsored. So we're really lending to the company itself, um, really lending usually a multiple of MR if it's a SaaS subscription company. Um, don't require that equity sponsorship. And the other piece that's different with us is we don't have warrants or equity kickers on the back end that a lot of other venture debt lenders do. So traditional venture debt lenders will not only require the equity sponsorship piece, but they'll also have a piece of equity that's associated with it. Um, there are some other firms in Australia that do this. So Partners for Growth, which is another US firm that's expanded um, to Australia is pretty active. They're a little bit up market from us and more equity sponsored. So certainly becoming a more popular financing model, not only um, in the US, but abroad um, throughout the world. Fantastic, thank you. And finally, I'm going to ask Lee to tell us a little bit about what a secondary fund is and why are they so important to Australia? Thanks, Kate. Well, really the genesis of doing a secondary fund for us came out of the, the Aconex journey. So over the years of raising multiple rounds to build our business, um, in between rounds, we often had staff or early investors who wanted some liquidity on their shareholding. and. When, you, when you're not listed, that's quite hard to do. Uh, and so what we do is we had a couple of shareholders that were quite supportive and they would provide essentially that secondary facility, if you like, or buy those shares from those people uh, where it made sense for both parties. So we, as a company, kind of step out of the way, let them talk to each other and work out what that transaction looks like. Uh, so that's that was sort of in our journey, it was very helpful and uh, there wasn't anybody providing that in the Australian market. Uh, in the US there's dedicated secondary providers, uh, but in the Australian market there wasn't and we thought it'd be a good idea to provide that capital into the market. And essentially what we're looking to do is exactly what happened on the Aconex journey. We're looking to buy shares from either uh, early investors, staff, sometimes founders, although 
I guess we don't love founders exiting big positions, but certainly founders taking a little bit off the table is, uh, is of course, completely fine. Uh, but looking at those companies that are in, you know, growing rapidly, are in between rounds, uh, have a secondary component that they want to uh, transact on. Um, and so we've just raised this fund. It's about a $50 million fund, a bit over $50 million, and we're starting to deploy that at the moment. In terms of the importance for Australia, um, sorry, the second part of your question, Kate, I'll just um, say that it's, in a sense, it's about increasing velocity within the, the startup ecosystem. So if we can recycle capital, particularly back to early investors, they're then able to reinvest into early stage companies. So it's about increasing that velocity of capital through the ecosystem. I think as the Australian market, the Victorian market is maturing, uh, there's opportunities like the secondary fund that we're doing. And congratulations on raising the fund in, in a rather unusual year as well. <laughs> so. Yeah, I wouldn't have thought we'd be raising through a pandemic, but all went well, so that's good. <laughs> Very good. So I'd like to focus a little bit on Australia's investment landscape. And Lee, I might throw it back to you because you've raised significant capital in your time as CEO of Aconex, uh, both in Australia and globally. How is the Australian uh, funding landscape different from the US and how do you think it's changing? I think, well, certainly if I go back to the early days of Aconex, there wasn't a lot of funding in Australia. I mean, that was the reality. It was very tough to raise money. Um, I think the Australian market, the Victorian market has matured dramatically in the last 10 to 15 years. We're seeing a lot of uh, VC funds, uh, the likes of whether it's Blackbird, Square Peg, Grand Percent and others that are doing, doing really well. So the market certainly matured a lot. Um, differences to the US, I'd say there's still this difference in, in, in specialty. So having companies as specialty providers uh, in the US, for example, when we raised money in 2008, there wasn't really anybody that could write a $60 million check for technology companies in Australia. Uh, we were doing about $30, $40 million of revenue at the time. Uh, that in the US would be classed as growth equity. We didn't really have a growth equity um, capability in Australia. So I think what's happened is there's a lot more money in the sector. It's specialising, so it's it's picking different stages uh, and, you know, including second quarter of inches is, is an example of that where we're specialising in the secondary component. I would say, and uh, probably a little bit of a plug for launch, Rick, there's still a bit of a gap in that seed stage. And that's one of the things that we're looking to do, but I'm sure we'll come to that later um, through launch week. But yeah, I think the, the market's certainly maturing and it's, uh, it's, it's a very different market to what it was 10 years ago, which is great for Australian companies. Absolutely. And uh, thank you for that. And a reminder to the audience, please do submit your questions through the Q&A channel and I'll do my best to moderate them. Uh, John, I'm going to, to throw to you. Um, you know, I'd be really interested in your observations, having recently entered the Australian market. How do you find it different from the US market and, and what attracted Lighter Capital to come and launch in Australia in the first place? Yeah, no, great question. Um, so we started really talking to Australian companies, Australian entrepreneurs earlier this year around the honestly the february march time frame which was timed interestingly with the <laughs> pandemic and such um and it's been an initiative for, of ours for a while to expand internationally um so as far as international expansion um we focus on countries that were also english speaking um you know similar kind of business culture um have a strong tech ecosystem so for us canada and australia were two of those ecosystems so we've expanded in canada um and as well as australia too um, Australia was interesting for the second part of your question for a couple reasons, uh, besides what I mentioned. One, we have, um, and NAB's corporate venture group is actually an investor in our firm. Um, so they're very keen on us expanding to Australia to help them kind of expand their tech lending practice, since most of the tech lending they do is very late stage kind of pre IPO, similar to what you see with like a Silicon Valley bank in the U S. Um, so that was another reason too, besides obviously it just being a great market. Um, as far as kind of what I've seen, um, I mean, to Lee's point, like definitely a lack of capital comparatively to the U.S., right? You could say the U.S. market is overcapitalized. Um, so that's one item that I've seen. Um, I would say a result of that is Australian entrepreneurs are just much more capital efficient. Um, you don't see the sort of kind of burn rates and kind of grow at all costs kind of mentality that you see in the U.S., which is actually really refreshing especially as a lender and the sort of structures that we do. Um, I also just think culturally, just talking to folks, I think Australian entrepreneurs are just a little bit more conservative, um, which is also great for our business. Um, also seems like Australian entrepreneurs are very quick to expand internationally. Um, you know, they're keen on expanding to the US or other markets or Asia and, you know, abroad and, and Europe. Um, so those are probably the two major ones I've noticed as I would say, um, just much more kind of conservative um, capital efficient companies and then the international expansion piece. 
Very interesting. Thank you. And do you think that as a result of um, the capital efficiency, do you think you're getting better deals here in Australia um, in, in terms of valuations or is that a bit of a furphy? Um, well, we don't, since we're a lender, we don't really think in terms of equity valuations, but in terms of a credit pro profile, definitely. Yeah. Um, you know, companies are much more capital efficient. Um, it seems like they weren't as impacted by the recession and such. Um, and obviously Australia as a whole, well, especially compared to the US has done a lot better with the pandemic too. So that's another reason, frankly, is I think we're a little bit, um, we're not as optimistic on the US in the short term as maybe Australia, since obviously the pandemic is, is more under control there. So um, that's another reason that's interesting. Yeah, very interesting. So Jill, how about crowdfunding? How do you think crowdfunding in Australia compares to other markets globally? Um, I think with the equity-based crowdfunding, um, Australia was a bit later to the party. So the UK was quite advanced and then um, the US came on board and then Australia. Um, but since Australia opened up to proprietary companies um, in 2018, October 2018, I think um, it's now sort of um, becoming much more um, um, used as a channel for early stage startups and opening up to proprietary companies from public and listed companies made quite a difference in terms of the uptake and number of people who are looking at the opportunity. I think people are still getting used to understanding what's involved and some people have a bit of perception that oh, it's an easy way to raise funding or I can jump on board quite quickly and get some funding. But I think if people are thinking about using equity crowdfunding in terms of timing, it's worth thinking out about, well, maybe you know six to eight months out before you might actually be able to get some funds in the door because by the time you've um, built up some of your crowd and got your assets together, um, got some um, um, a bit of publicity to start with before you actually launch your campaign, um, then it, it does take time and work to get through it. So probably in terms of your journey, I would um, put in sort of six to eight months in terms of the, the timing to um, get a successful equity crowdfunding campaign funded. So I'd, I'd like to continue exploring that a little bit because we do have a, a number of um, startups on, on the line and I know they're, they're he keen to hear how they can access different funding opportunities. So I wouldn't mind just exploring a little bit of in, into what your ideal portfolio company is looking for and what, what it, you know, when should, should companies start be thinking about these, these other um, opportunities. So Lee, I might start with, with you. What's second quarter's ideal portfolio company? So firstly, great companies, great entrepreneurs, just like a VC, we, we want to back great companies uh, and we're always looking yeah, for great great founders, uh, good business models and high growth. Uh, clearly technology um, is mostly where we're going to focus. In terms of specific sizes and those sorts of things, we'd, we'd look at companies you know, a little bit, little bit further along in their journey. So typically, so $75 million valuation plus, um, not to say we wouldn't go a bit lower, but we're certainly not going down into, into seed rounds. Uh, it's much more where a company is more established. And to be honest, it does make a lot of sense to be doing a secondary sort of one, two, three years into a company's journey. So we're typically later, uh, perhaps five to 10 years down the track uh, and pre-IPOs. We're not going obviously through into IPO markets, but not so we wouldn't hold a company post IPO, but we're looking at companies in that, in that $75 million valuation plus uh, and uh, growing fast, you know, good revenue, obviously product market fit already, uh, you know, getting rid I say revenue, so the business is scaling up. Um, so you can say, in, in a sense, there's they're more scale ups than startups. So we're looking at, um, or, or, or on the cusp between a startup and a scale up. And I'm going to go work backwards. I think through the, um, the the life cycle of a startup. So John, I think you're next off the rank. Um, what's your ideal portfolio look like? A portfolio company look like? Yeah. Um, so we work with mostly B2B SaaS software subscription companies. We don't do a ton of BDC. We'll do some. Um, so for us, it's honestly, it's all about recurring revenue um, since we're really lending against that recurring revenue model. So you have to have a revenue model or you have to have existing revenue to work with us. So generally, we need to see at least kind of 200,000 annualized revenue. Um, you have renewal history with customer base. It's a pretty um, diversified customer base too. So it's usually companies um, generating at least 20,000 AUD a month, all the way up to companies maybe doing kind of a million a month AUD kind of in that range. Um, average is probably kind of one to 3 million as far as annualized recurring revenue. And then we're, that's really what we're lending against. Um, and then the capital efficiency piece that I mentioned earlier too. And so we don't really think in terms of um, financing stage, 
it's really more kind of revenue size, right? And kind of having those proven metrics that, that we like to see. And, and Jill, could, um, I think, you know, you mentioned before that um, crowdfunding is really filling that gap in a way between friends, family and fools and, and angels. But um, could you give us an example of a great crowdfunding um, campaign that you've seen and why was it successful? Um, well, there's a great campaign, actually, that we're running at the moment, actually. Um, um, it's um, two girls from Melbourne, um, Catherine and Anio, who um, have um, created an edible coffee cup. So um, as probably know in Australia, about 2.5 million coffee cups with pre-COVID a day were going to landfill. Um, and um, they've created um, a cup made of oats um, that you can eat. And even if you don't eat it, um, it decomposes um, within a short space of time, as in two to six weeks. So it's a fantastic product. Um, and so what they've done very well is they've done some, um, they've done a great video, they've done some great visuals um, and they're, they're doing a great job in terms of getting engagement for their cup. Um, one of the things with um, that is it's also B2B as well for cafes. So um, that bit is a bit more of a challenge when it's B2B because um, at the moment, moment businesses aren't always that engaged or aren't that used to jumping onto crowdfunded campaigns um, but one of the most important things that people often forget is obviously crowdfunding it says it in the title it's about the crowd and um, what people often come to us with is saying okay well we're ready to start we've got a thousand likes on Facebook but actually a thousand likes on Facebook is quite um, you know, can be quite irrelevant. Um, it's much better to get um, email addresses, people who are actively engaged. And then if you think about it, the number of people that you need, it's actually, um, you know, only two to 5% of those people might actually be prepared to actually make a payment or invest in a campaign. So you really need to think about the numbers in advance. And with the um, Flowhive campaign, just out of interest, um, okay, that's a, quite an exceptional because their product was an amazing product. And it was, um, you know, the biggest innovation in beekeeping for 150 years. But they, before they launched, they had 70,000 email addresses. So it, it's just, um, and people who have signed up specifically because they're interested in that project. People sometimes also think, okay, well, people might be generally interested because, say, for example, a platform has an audience, but it's really about people being really interested in that specific project or their specific product. So that's um, quite key in terms of building that crowd um, and the all important part and not spending too much time on creating such a perfect campaign page, but having no crowd. So, um, and it does take hard work, but it's, um, it's crucial to the success. So we're getting a few questions coming through and I'm going to turn my attention to them. Please do keep sending them in. Um, there's a question um, from JH who says, I've heard that angels from, they've heard from angels and VCs that they don't like to invest in companies that have used crowdfunding for their initial raise. Um, I'm going to throw that actually um, to all three speakers because I know all of you are investing at various different stages. So um, Jill, maybe if we start with you and then I'll throw to Lee and John and get your views on this. Yes, um, sometimes um, we do hear that. Um, so there's, I think we should split here between reward-based and equity-based. Um, some people, when a reward-based campaign has happened, obviously, it showed there is proof of concept and there's traction for a product and idea. So having a reward-based campaign can be helpful when you're going to angel investors because it shows that you've been able to actually, it's more than an idea, you've got some traction. Um, with equity-based crowdfunding, sometimes we do hear that people don't want that many investors on their cap table. Um, but I think it's quite important to think through what you're actually doing and how it fits your business model. So if we take an example of one of the first equity crowdfunding campaigns in Australia was DC Power. And they were quite unique um, globally because they had so many investors. They managed to get 15,000 investors on an equity crowdfunding campaign. So some people will turn around and say, but my goodness, having that many people on your cap table. But actually for DC Power, it was part of their strategy because those people or their customers. So it's quite important to think through what you're actually doing in terms of the business model. And it's not really a case of one size fits all. And um, the other point I would make is um, in other markets um, where crowd, equity crowdfunding has been stronger, it's becoming more acceptable. So in the UK market, um, and sometimes it can be an issue, but it is becoming more acceptable to have um, had an equity crowdfunding campaign first and got um, traction and got those people who are your um, 
early stage shareholders as your greatest advocates for your business. So um, there are some advantages of having um, that um, early stage audience and those people who are really shouting about your brand and your, 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 your product. So I'm going to throw the question to, to Lee and, and then John, but there's a couple of other questions that are related and they're coming from startups that are looking for alternative vest investment vehicles for uh, pre-revenue and seed stage companies. So um, two questions to you both. Um, one is, um, what do you think about crowdfunding on the cap table? And two, what would your advice be to, to the seed companies and founders that are joining us here today that are looking for alternatives to your traditional angel seed rounds? Personally, I don't think it matters to me anyway as an investor where if somebody's had crowdfunding, as Jill says, I think it's it, it can validate a product. There's a whole lot of good reasons uh, to do it. Um, you know, this comment about having too many investors on a, on a cap table, um, I'm kind of with Jill on this one, I, I don't think that's really a problem. I, once you go beyond 20 or 30 investors, whether you're managing 20 or 30 or 300, it's, a, it's the same amount of work. You send out a letter to everybody, you have a meeting, you do a Zoom, you do a, an AGM, whatever it is. So I don't think it's too much of a problem. I think the uh, as long as you still control your business uh, or you have supportive investors controlling the business, I think um, what, what's happening at the edges of the cap table to me is not that important. Um, at the end of the day, you have to get a business going and whatever you need to do to drive your business, you do. We, we did some things on the Akenings journey that in hindsight, I wouldn't have done. Um, you know, I would have done it is there a perfect investor out there to raise from all the time? Well, possibly, but we don't live in a perfect world. So sometimes you take money where you can get money and that means you may have an imperfect investor from time to time. And that's that's the nature of growing a business. And I think it's perfect. So I think, you know, if you need money to a business, I wouldn't hesitate to go, you know, obviously go to the standard sources, but look further afield if you if you need to. And if you can get the funds to grow your business, it'll pay off. Um, I think just not being too precious about it. One other thing I'd say is that people often say, well, you need investors who are going to bring a whole lot to your business. And um, there's, again, I'm talking as an entrepreneur here, not as an investor, but I think a lot of investors oversell what they can bring to your business. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, you've got to build your business. You need the money to drive it. Um, you look for sources that will give that to you. Give up a bit. I think probably the one thing I'd say to investors is it's not so much where you find capital, but actually getting capital. I think too many founders, too many entrepreneurs are hesitant to raise money. And you know, that to me is what actually kills businesses, not having the fuel to drive your business. So whether that's very early stage, doing a crowdfunding round, whether it's doing a seed round, whether it's expansion capital to scale your business up, getting the capital fuel growth to me is way more important than getting the perfect investor and getting the terms absolutely 100% you know, you know, uh, perfect. Mm. And John, how about yourself? And, uh, you know, to pick, particularly pick up on the question of what are the other funding options that are available in, in the Valley of Death? And uh, wh where would you send early stage companies? Yeah, I don't personally have a ton of experience with crowdfunding. Um, just to start that, I just, I don't see it as much on the B2B side. Um, I would say to your earlier question too, um, I, the market's just becoming, I mean, there's a ton more options and I would say people are just much more receptive about it. Like I would say, you know, three or four years ago um, when VCs would look at a company that we lent to, they'd be like, well, what is this loan structure? What is this, you know, lending structure you have with this firm? They didn't quite understand it, but now it's becoming more commonplace. And I think that's true of alternative finance in general. Um, people are just becoming more open-minded and realizing that in the 21st century, there's so many different ways you can finance and build your business. Um, you know, as far as kind of other options for startups, um, we work mostly pre-Series A. So that's where I spend most of my time is companies that have raised a seed round, kind of friends and family sort of thing. And they're gearing up for a Series A, or maybe they want to push out that Series A and just go straight to growth equity if they can. So that's where I spend most of my time. Um, obviously, there's a ton of debt-based financing options that are coming in, coming online. Um, you have, you know, these other kind of micro VCs, kind of seed stage VCs too, um, that are becoming more popular. So I think, you know, any of those are kind of a combination of those are um, options. But I think the point being is there's just a ton more optionality than even there was like three or four years ago. And people, investors are becoming more open-minded about those options and how a company finances itself in the earliest stage. Yeah, so great segue to my next question, which is um, to look at in investors. We've got a number of investors on the line and um, we've spent a lot of time at LaunchVic espousing the benefits of angel investing and the importance of educating yourself as an angel um, 
but um, I'd, I'd really like to hear from you the pitch of why should an investor be thinking about crowdfunding venture debt or revenue-based finance or, or secondary funds. So John, maybe we'll throw back to you to begin with, um, given you, you led the segue. What, why is this an attractive mechanism for investors? Um, I, so angel investors and early stage investors have already invested in a company. I actually like it when companies work with us. Um, cause normally if obviously you're an early stage investor, you're a seed stage angel investor. Um, you know, your company is going to go out and raise equity. You're going to get diluted down. So the investors, at least on the early stage side, um, really like that, that a company can work with us as an example and not get diluted as much. And I would say it's probably true with any other kind of alternative financing sources. Um, and then on the other side of the market, um, we get a ton of inbound interest. Um, from growth equity investors that get really excited when we can refer them a company that we've worked with or, you know, we've talked to or gotten to know where, you know, they've built essentially a 10, 15 million year company and they've raised very minimal equity capital because they have a clean cap table that they can come in, right? Um, and they're already, you know, probably capital efficient, that sort of thing. So I, I would say, you know, on both sides of the market and kind of the earlier stage and the later stage, that's, that's what I've seen in my experience. And Lee, how about secondary funds? What's the what, what's the um, hook that's going to get investors in? <laughs> well, I mean, we we say that firstly you need to understand the venture market. So the, the people, the investors are coming into second quarter typically have a little bit of understanding of venture. Um, not all, uh, but but most would have done some form of venture investing in the past. Uh, you know, any venture investing, of course, you've got to understand the types of return profile you're going to get, and I think understanding is why you invest through a fund, understanding that for every company that succeeds, there might be you know, another four or five or 10 that don't. Um, so one of the benefits of going in through a, a fund, um, whether it's a VC fund or a secondary fund, is you spread your risk. So you, you don't need to have every single company you invest in succeed because the ones that do really well with the returns they generate uh, should cover all the rest. And, and that's a typical VC profile. Uh, what second quarter is doing a little bit differently is really Yes, we've still got that diversification, but we're, we're not going for quite the same profile as a VC fund where you might have one out of 10 that really hits a home run. We'd be look, we're looking at more to in the three to five X range, but not having too many zeros. So it's just a slightly different return profile to what you get in a, a typical VC. Um, I'd like to think you know, the way that we work with the VCs and private equity groups in Australia is we'll hopefully get to pick the crop a little bit um, and get the best uh, of each of the funds. So um, I think that's uh, one of the attractions we see. And so we think we can generate great return, um, risk adjusted, you know, comparable to VC or possibly even better, uh, given that we're, we're picking the best of the bunch as they come through and working with those uh, with those companies. I think that thing excites us from a, from a personal point of view is the ability to work with great founders. So um, that's, you know, that's why we're doing it personally, but I think we can generate and help those companies. But I think we can generate uh, great returns for investors as well. Fantastic. And Jill, how about for, for crowdfunding? Well, I think um, if the venture investor is coming in as the cornerstone as part of a campaign, um, one of the things to, um, it can be quite valuable because their investments obviously can be used to attract um, the other investors. And then the funds that have been raised through that raise can then be used to expand the business um, and do, do, do a lot more. Um, one thing to bear in mind is with equity crowdfunding, the campaigns are all or nothing. So if, for example, um, somebody's trying to raise a um, million dollars and the um, angel investor comes in at 300,000, then um, if you get to um, 500,000, that's not good enough. And that might be um, also helpful for the angel investor just um, as a, a signal to see, you know, how easy it's going to be to raise the next round. But um, it, it, it can be um, a, good, uh, a good measure of um, how good the company is at attracting other investors as well. So it can be used in, a, in quite a positive light um, to try and um, generate more funds um, to expand, expand the business more quickly. So, so we've got a question coming through on the channel from Daniel Mumbry about venture studios as an, another form of alternative investment. And we, we're starting to see, um, you know, I think there's been much more commonplace in the US that the venture studio model. Um, we're starting to see a little bit of that happening at Launch Vic. I'd be really interested, John, in your views on, on venture studios. Um, I have some experience with them. I mean, generally, it's kind of obviously very early stage kind of idea stage so not an area i play as much um 
but I've seen a lot of success with companies that have come out of them um, in the U.S., whether it's Bay Area, Seattle, or other places. So definitely becoming um, more commonplace. And it seems, and obviously the, the individuals that usually run these venture studios are a lot of times former VCs or really well connected with VCs. So it is very helpful as far as getting introductions to other capital sources once they have kind of a proven business and product and they're up and running. We've got another question on the channel, which I was going to turn our attention to, and that was um, from Mark Barber. Given the global economic situation, is fundraising harder, easier, or about the same at present? And I'd also like to um, expand that, if I may, just to say, what, what are you hearing from the ground when you're talking to founders about the experiences of 2020? Um, Lee, I'll throw to you first. As an investor, I was hoping there'd be some great deals out there, but it seems to me that you know, there's, I think people are raising money. I think there's money out there. I think for businesses that, you know, for businesses that have grown well through COVID, a lot of tech businesses, a lot of digital businesses have, have performed very well through COVID. Uh, so I'm seeing pretty good rates of, you know, companies raising money at the moment. I think uh, um, investment Build Exact, they just recently did, Build Exact, they just recently did a $6 million dollar round. Uh, there's lots of other companies raising money at the moment. So I think, I don't think there's any shortage of capital at the moment. I, I'm not saying that, that makes it easy to raise money. It's always hard to raise money. So I don't I don't say that lightly, but I think there's plenty of pools of capital around at the moment. Uh, and again, in our experience, raising $50 million for second quarter, we set out to get 25 to 30, and we were amazed at the, the response we got. I think the, the one positive, perhaps from a fundraising point of view for, uh, you know, for the market is with interest rates so low, people are looking for other places to deploy capital. So I think that's encouraging investors to look a bit further afield, uh, which means that those investors are more likely to invest in venture and alternative types of venture investments. So that means hopefully more money for startups. Um, and I'll plug our fund of funds. I'll probably come to that later, Kate, but uh, the fund of funds that the, the Victorian government has announced is an example of where we think we can deploy funds, a $60 million fund to be doubled and doubled. So 240 million into the startup sector, the seed, seed at a seed stage in Victoria. I think there's plenty of capital out there at the moment. Um, so don't, don't hesitate to go and get it if you need it. Great advice. And John, how about you, you know, in, in your impression of Australian markets, what have your conversations been with Australian entrepreneurs versus for example, US-based entrepreneurs about the year that's been and, and the capital environment? Um, yeah, I mean, obviously for a couple of months, obviously in the March, April timeframe, I think whether it was Australia or the US, um, things kind of froze. I had at least five or six companies I work with that were actually all supposed to be closing on a series A, our growth equity round, um, all their term sheets got pulled last minute, um, you know, all the LPs and, and the funds that were um, looking to invest basically kind of said, hey, wait, we're not trying to put any money the companies right now. So that was a notable trend. Um, I think honestly, all those companies that had those term sheets pulled ended up raising around later this year in the past couple months. So either those same investors came back around or they got yeah, term sheets from other investors at, at better terms. Um, the biggest impact that I've seen and heard from people um, is to Lee's point, not necessarily on the valuation side, um, it's just been the struggle of kind of not meeting people in person. It's just kind of a weird environment to be fundraising, right? If you're not sitting down and doing the kind of traditional kind of coffee or, you know, for a VC kind of on-site diligence, um, I think that's just made it, it's a lot tougher um, to connect with people and have, go through that kind of traditional fundraising process. That said, talk to a lot of VCs that have done the entire diligence process online and they've found a way to make it work too. So um, I think it's just the, you know, inability to connect, uh, not having all those conferences and those traditional avenues. Jill, how about crowdfunding? How has that been affected through the pandemic? Um, at the early stage of the pandemic, um, we were dealing with quite a few companies that were um, creating new products. And so one of the things that we were finding was they'd um, been talking to people overseas about manufacturing overseas and about getting prototypes made. And um, there seemed to be a lot of problems starting in um, sort of supply chains or um, things getting um, delivered. And in the last couple of months, we've seen a bit more of a switch to people looking at whether they can manufacture um, in Australia um, and whether they can get machines, then get tooling. Um, and 
I think that's made, uh, it's just all of a sudden there's a bit more shift in terms of that focus. Um, obviously, sometimes the pricing in terms of it can be more expensive, but people are being quite innovative in looking at new ways to um, develop products. And it's going to be interesting to see um, what difference it makes in terms of um, how much more Australian manufacturing um, does develop as a result of this, which is quite quite exciting. Um, in terms of um, picking up of investment and campaigns, um, there was um, a lull, and then in the last couple of months, things seem to be picking up again. Um, and Australia seems, I think, um, um, as John said, I think um, at the beginning, I think um, Australia will probably accelerate um, very quickly before quite a lot of other economies um, early next year. Mm. Yeah, very interesting. And and Jill, we've got a couple of questions specifically come through for you on the chat. Um, one of them, I think you touched on a little bit earlier about the number of million dollar plus campaigns that have been successfully raised. How many how many are you seeing in market? And the second question um, is about SaaS startups campaigns and how often is crowdfunding used for SaaS products? Um, um, in terms of the million dollar plus campaigns, in terms of equity, we're starting to see a number come through, but it is um, a case of it being quite hard work and having the right product market fit. And I think it's important um, before you actually go to do an equity crowdfunding campaign, that you've already um, worked out your product market fit. It, you need to be um, already um, engaged in building that traction and audience. Um, with um, SaaS type campaigns, for a product um, or award type um, um, platform, um, they are, it is more challenging. It can be useful sometimes to do something on a very small scale just to um, test the idea. But if you're looking for a substantial investment, it is, it is quite a challenge to use it for that basis. So sometimes what people do is they do a very small campaign um, to be used as proof of concept almost, and um, to then go to equity crowdfunding or angel investors um, to try and um, get further investment for their, for their, for their model. Thank you. So I'd like to um, just turn um, your attention to do a bit more open questions, but um, if you had one word of advice for a, a founder that's, that's here today around um, your respective different types of, of um, investing, what would be the, the hot tips that you would be sharing with, in, with, with founders or indeed investors um, as they, they come to approach you? John, I might throw to you first. Um, yeah, um, you know, our business in a sense is doing well because I think a lot of companies don't want to necessarily raise equity capital right now. Um, you know, it's just difficult to connect with people. So we've done really well because obviously I have a lot of companies approach me that want to push out an equity round, you know, six, 12, 18 months. They just feel like it's not kind of the best time right now with some of the economic uncertainty. Um, so I think if you have that option, you know, probably, probably do it if you can. A um, little bit tougher market right now. Um, obviously, hopefully the world will be in a better place in another 12 months. So um, that's been my conversation with a lot of entrepreneurs, whether US or Australia is, you know, if you can push out an equity raise, if you can continue to kind of conserve cash and, and hunker down, right? This is a sustained crisis in some form for, unfortunately, probably another, you know, 12 months, maybe not as severe, um, but, you know, it's going to continue. So I'd say kind of continue to conserve cash as, as much as possible um, while still, you know, making decent investments in the business and, and trying to grow. And Lee, how about yourself? We're sitting at second quarter ventures. Yeah, we're a little bit different from a standard VC. I think first thing is that the, the founders are committed to the business. Um, they're not about to sell. If a founder comes to us wanting to sell all their stake in the business, they're probably not a great investment opportunity. So uh, you know, they're coming to us for the right reason. Um, and really that's around managing a cap table. So uh, what we're trying to do is find founders who will benefit from us working with them uh, to perhaps you might have a, a former staff member who's left, who has some shares that you want to, they want to sell. You might have an existing member of staff who know, has been with the company a long time, wants to buy a house or put a deposit on a house or something like that. Um, hopefully not buying a yacht, but you know, something where it's uh, helping their family. Uh, you know, that's where, you know, being able to free up a little bit of liquidity for, for staff. And as I mentioned earlier on in the call, you know, for investors, if investors, early stage investors want to, you know, exit some of their positions to be able to reinvest. So we're looking for the reasons why somebody might want to sell uh, and then providing that liquidity to help the company manage its cap table. So um, yeah, another way to think about it is we want to see founders and CEOs who are thinking about those issues. Uh, and that we can help them, you know, solve uh, any problems they might have around their cap table. 
Fantastic. And Jill, you've given us a number of pearls of wisdom, but um, I'm going to throw the question to you as well. What, what would you advise founders? What are your hot tips for founders that are looking to raise? Um, well, for crowdfunding, I think the um, success is all predetermined in the pre-campaign phase. So it's all about the preparation. It's everything you do before you launch the campaign. Um, and just a couple of tips, I would say, focus on um, the video and the visuals, um, to think about building your crowd, obviously, in advance. And then also, one thing that we found is that um, campaigns that are run by teams um, are much more successful than um, campaigns run by one individual. And so if you can think of it at the beginning in terms of if you've got to build a crowd, if you, you need to build your team to start with um, with different skills and um, being able to bounce off each other. So um, I, think, I think that's what I would say in terms of the tips for um, a successful campaign. Fantastic. So we've got 10 minutes left and um, we've managed to survive 50 minutes without bringing up budget. And I have no doubt that there are a lot of people on the line that are very anxious to hear what LaunchVic is doing. Um, and uh, in the context of us being awarded 40 million through the Victorian state budget for our own operations, and we'll have more to say about that in the new year. We're busy working through an updated strategy, but um, areas that I'm particularly excited about are our $60 million Victorian Startup Capital Fund, which is a fund of funds for early stage VC, a 10 million women's angel sidecar fund and a 25 million venture growth fund, which is a venture debt um, support. So Lee, can I throw to you, um, you've been instrumental in helping us achieve this fantastic budget outcome. Um, and, uh, and also, um, you know, more broadly, it's not just the budget outcome we've got, but innovation is firmly on the agenda in Victoria with a $2 billion breakthrough fund and R&D loans and, and, and other initiatives um, across agriculture, med tech, biotech and beyond. Can I ask you to, to comment a little bit about what, where you think the future is going in the investment landscape and what would you like to see um, in the next few years as we at Launch Vic are charged with rolling out some of these initiatives? Thanks, Kate. Uh, firstly, I'd say big congratulations to you and the team. Um, I'm only recently chair, so six months, so I can't take too much credit for all the hard work that's gone into uh, you know, the funding that Launch Vic's had to continue its programs, which are on the back of very successful programs, but also particularly around the funder funds. Uh, you know, that $60 million going into the startup sector from the government is a lot of Kate and the team's hard work. So well done and thank you uh, for all your hard work on behalf of Victorian startups and the Victorian investment community. Um, in terms of the government, I, I think, well, in terms of the opportunity, firstly, I think dislocations in uh, economies and there's not, you know, whether it's a GFC or now COVID-19 provide opportunity. So I think when things change, uh, that creates the opportunity to really, um, I guess, to disrupt the way things are done. We've seen, you know, I mean, we're using Zoom now. We've seen so many examples where uh, technology has been accelerated by years, um, sometimes many, many years uh, over the last uh, last six months or so, six to nine months. So I think there's that real acceleration and change that's happened through COVID. So to me, that's, while it's a challenge, it's also opportunity. And uh, I think the, the second thing I commend the Victorian government on this is that understanding that we don't want to create the jobs, we don't want to just fund jobs, we want to create the jobs of the future. So being able to invest into all of you on this call, um, the founders, the investors that are supporting the startup ecosystem in Victoria and Australia, that's what will generate the next wave of jobs and sustainable jobs, sustainable, uh, high value, uh, very rewarding jobs. I think for every old job we create, those jobs tend to go. Um, so it's a short term hit, whereas we can create long term jobs in technology, uh, in you know, innovation based industry. So I think that's hugely exciting. I think the government's got behind that, which is great. Um, I think this sector, uh, startups, technology, in the innovation sector in Victoria, can help be a real shining light as we come out of COVID and really create um, not just a great economy, but jobs, sustainable jobs that, uh, you know, that, that will be there for the long term, enable Australian Victorian companies to take on the world and be the best in the world at what they do. So I'm excited. I think it's it's a challenge, uh, you know, clearly with COVID, but it pr provides opportunity. I think Lord Vic's in a great position to deliver on that. So um, to you, Kate and the team, uh, keep going, we need you. And uh, I think uh, the whole sector needs what we can do to deliver, you know, the, this next wave of jobs. Well, thank you, Lee. And yeah, it's a very exciting time, but clearly there's a lot of work ahead of us and we're uh, working very closely with the sector. And um, to close out, I'd, I'd also like to um, just make a comment that, you know, many ecosystems are seeded by government, if not all ecosystems, even Silicon Valley was seeded by a huge amount of government investment. 
I'm really interested as uh, Jill, uh, uh, you know, someone who is currently based in, in the UK or, at the, or located in the UK for this purpose of this call, but not based in Victoria and John in, in Seattle. What are your views looking into um, states like Victoria where governments are backing in behind innovation in a really big, big way? I'd be really interested in your views. Jill, you first. Um, I think it's fantastic. Um, I think it's um, so exciting. And I think um, just after the tough times that everybody's had in Victoria in terms of um, that sustained period of lockdown, um, it can show it's really been sort of worthwhile in terms of um, when John mentioned earlier, just the state in terms of um, different locations around the world. I know I'm just temporarily in, in the UK. And oh, I think we're losing Jill again. Wait a second, if not, John, I might throw to you. Yeah, um, I mean, I, I think it's exciting. It makes a ton of sense. You know, obviously, you mentioned, um, you know, Silicon Valley and a lot of the original kind of tech innovation in the United States were started by government programs, really, right? Really a function of the Defense Department, a lot of the research that they were doing. So obviously has a, you know, a potential to have a massive multiplier effect um, and is, is great for um, the state of Victoria and, and, you know, continuing to grow the innovation economy. Absolutely. And we certainly hope that, um, you know, from our position at Launch Vic, that we're continuing to connect in the world. And if there's one thing that this year has taught us is that, um, you know, distance that was often deemed as something that was a negative has gone away. And, and the fact that, John, we've got you dialing in from Seattle, unfortunately, we've lost Jill momentarily, but she's dialing in from the UK. It is a, a new world and, and we're here to take advantage of it. Um, so in, in closing, I'd really just like to um, once again say I think we're, we're really on the cusp of something very special here in Victoria. Um, as I think a lot of people know at Launch Vic, we're all terribly passionate about the startup sector and the future is bright. And um, thanks to the Victorian government, we really have got something very special ahead of us to drive a sector that can make a massive difference to our economy. Um, there's obviously a lot of ways that that happened and alternative investments are certainly part of that. And thank you to Lee, uh, Jill and John for sharing your insights and wisdom and for doing all the work that you do to, to grow and support our community here in Australia. It's um, very much appreciated by everybody across the board. Um, as always, I'd like to thank the LaunchVic team for their hard work in pulling this together. And finally, thank you for everyone to attending for attending. Um, we, we love um, these conversations and, and, and the engagement. We very much look forward to doing it in person next year. And uh, we wish you all the best uh, for the festive season. And may 2021 be very, very different from 2020 for all of us. So thank you. And, and thanks again. And, and, and Jill, I know you've just popped back in again, but we thank you for, for joining, especially so early in the morning. So okay. thank, thank you. you. Thanks, Kate. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. Thanks, thank Kate. Appreciate it.